Hello Year 12. Okay, this one is going to be a very quick one. Um, it's just to look at the characteristics of dystopic fiction. So in literature, dystopia is futuristic. It uh, is presents an oppressive world where society is controlled by corporations, bureaucracy, technology, morality or totalitarianism. It looks into the future, uh, sometimes not as far into the future as we would imagine, such as in 1994 was only uh, close, closely in the future. iRobot is another one that starts relatively early and close to our age. But it looks into the future and it presents a world of what is going to happen if what is currently going on in the world continues to happen so it is a even though it's futuristic it is a criticism about the current trends societal norms or political systems that are in place so it's an exaggerated worst case scenario and so when you were looking at metropolis in 1984 you were looking at them as what are they criticizing at the in, during the time that they were made what was going on in the time that they were made that was making the composer feel that in a worst case scenario this future is where we're headed. There are quite a few characteristics of dystopia fiction that are characteristic to all dystopia fiction and which also can be seen in both Metropolis and 1984. Firstly we have propaganda. Uh, and how it is used to control the citizens. It's more evident in 1984 uh, than it is in Metropolis, but it is there. But in 1984, it's, the easiest way to see it is in how it's presented in the two minute hates, uh, where the, show, the people uh, showed the footage that riles them up into a hate of Goldstein and the countries that the, um, we are warring with. Uh, it's also shown in how they uh, change the figures so you know one day they'll tell them that there's no shoes and then the next day they'll tell them that they've made 60,000 pairs of shoes overnight and it's to make the people love Big Brother because Big Brother is looking after them and it's all propaganda. Next one information independent thought and freedom are restricted this is evident in both Metropolis and 1984. Um, 1984 thought police, news speak, double speak all of those things are to restrict independent thought and to restrict information. Also the changing of the actual news in 1994 and the removal of books in 1994. Uh, and in Metropolis, it is the control of the workers. The workers not really knowing what's going on above them. And also the uh, people living in Metropolis are, have no idea of what is happening down in the deeps of the earth with where the workers are. And the workers don't apparently don't have any freedoms. Um, a figurehead or concept is worshipped by the societies of, by the citizens of society. Uh, in 1984, you could argue that Big Brother is the well, Big Brother is the figurehead. Um, you could argue that there is an element of worshipping. Um, in 1984, religion is definitely removed from the novel. In Metropolis, you have Joe Fredison, who is the figurehead. Uh, again, not necessarily worshipped, but notice that he resides in the new Tower of Babel. Uh, and we know the Tower of Babel reaching up to the heavens, trying to challenge God, trying to be God-like. Uh, then we have citizens are perceived to be under constant surveillance. This is evident in both Metropolis and 1984. Again, easier to pick up in 1984 because of the telescreens and the thought police. Uh, but in Metropolis, we even see it where Joe Fredison is looking at a screen and we he's watching what is happening with the workers. And of course, you have Freda being followed around by Thin Man as well to get that idea of constant surveillance. Citizens live in fear of the outside world. This is definite in 1984, uh, whereas the fear of that they're constantly at war with uh, one country or another, it keeps changing throughout the novel. And there's this idea that outside of the city walls, there's nothing but war, death and destruction. The next characteristics is the natural world is banished and distrusted. 
This is evident in both Metropolis and 1994. We've already talked about the lack of nature in Metropolis and how um, even where we see it in the Eternal Gardens, it is distorted and discarded. And in 1994 as well, there is a lack of nature and Winston has to travel outside the city to the country before he can find love. And it's very important to note that it is in the natural world that he first is able to see Julia for who she really is. Uh, and he can't see that while, whilst he's within the city gates. The other characteristic, citizens conform to uniform expectations and individuality is perceived as being bad. Both in 1984 and Metropolis, the workers are uniformed. There is a control over how they are presented. It is most evident in Metropolis in that opening uh, sequence. Uh, we see the cityscape and then we see the workers in that synchronised movement going on and off shift. And this idea that they are this one organic mass and not individuals. They're faceless, dehumanised. And there are very similar elements in 1984 as well. Finally, um, the last characteristic is society is an illusion of a utopian world. In 1984, the actual world that Winston lives in is meant to be this utopia because Big Brother is looking after them, saving them from the big bad world that's going on outside. And in uh, Metropolis, you have the world of Joe Fredison and Freda, where uh, you, know, you have the Eternal Gardens and the Yoshiwara Club, and the life that Freda is leaving is an illusion. He, it is literally built upon the backs of the workers. It's just that the people in the Metropolis Society are not aware of that. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this one. Um, it's just a quick one, and I will see you in class.